Hi everyone. I'm happy to have you in this introductory course on absorbed dose measurements for high energy photon and electron beams based on TRS-398 code of practice provided by the International Atomic Energy Agency. In this first lecture, I will introduce you to various things such as reference dosimetry, absolute dosimeters, and the primary standard lab laboratories, what does it mean, secondary standard laboratories, and also some of the work that IAEA WHO network does. And we'll also discuss the quantities that influence the absorbed dose measurements with the ion chamber. What is reference dosimetry? The basic output calibration of a clinical radiation being by virtue of direct measurement of dose or dose rate in water under specific reference conditions. This is referred to as the reference dosimetry. As on date, there are three different dosimetry techniques that are considered to be reference dosimetry. One is the calorimetry, freaky dosimetry, and ionization chamber dosimetry. This is a very interesting thing. What are absolute and relative dosimeters? A dosimeter is said to be an absolute dosimeter if that produces a signal from which the dose in its sensitive volume can be determined without requiring a calibration in known field of radiation. So absolute dosimeters should not require a calibration. It should directly give you absorbed dose. So calorimetry, fricky and free ionization chambers could be referred to absolute dosimeters. Then what do we do in our lab? When we measure the linear accelerator dose, can't we call it absolute dose? It is not measurement of absolute dose. You measure absorbed dose. And your dosimeters are called relative dosimeters because they require a calibration. You always calibrate it in a secondary standard dosimetry laboratory. You can only call it as relative dosimeters. So what you measure in your LINAC is absorbed dose measurement. It is not absolute dosimetry. I have also been thinking differently because most companies sell their pharma chamber as absolute dosimeters. But really by definition, they are not because they require a calibration factor. So the next question is, can ionization chamber be reference dosimeters or absolute dosimeters? Yes, they can be under specific conditions. One is standard free air ionization chamber, cavity ionization chamber, and phantom embedded extrapolation chambers. So these are absolute dosimeters. The ionization chamber can be either absolute dosimeters or relative dosimeters. It depends on the circumstances and the chamber that you are using. If you can get directly by measurement the dose, then it is absolute dosimetry. The chamber becomes an absolute dosimeter. If indirectly you arrive at the dose, then that is using a calibration factor, then the ion chamber becomes a relative dosimeter, right? So your ion chamber could either be a absolute dosimeter or a relative dosimeter, depending on the type. If it gives you directly the dose, then it is absolute dosimeter. If it requires a calibration factor, then it is a relative dosimeter. We have been talking about calibration factors for our ion chambers. How do you get this calibration factors? There are standard laboratories that can produce, that can provide you the calibration factors. They calibrate it under standard conditions. One is the BIPM in Paris, which is a very standard laboratory, not only for ion chamber measurement, it is standard for everything. For example, for the length, for the weight, and so many parameters, they are the standard. Then you have the primary standard laboratory, most countries have primary standard laboratory, for example, Germany, Canada, USA, Australia, where they have their primary standard laboratory for radiation dosimetry. Then 
you have second standard dosimetry laboratory. Countries like India, Bangladesh, several countries have a secondary standard dosimetry laboratory. What is the difference between the primary standard dosimetry laboratory and the secondary standard dosimetry laboratory? Primary standard dosimetry laboratory can do have measurement technique where they can directly provide you the absolute dose. Where a secondary standard dosimetry laboratory have an ion chamber or a dosimeter that requires a calibration. So they don't directly get absolute dose, but they have a calibration factor from a primary standard dosimetry laboratory. So this is the difference between primary standard and secondary standard dosimetry laboratory. IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, has a laboratory for dosimetry and it is a secondary standard dosimetry laboratory, but they provide significant amount of support for various countries and hospitals. We have been saying measurement of absolute dose under reference conditions. What do we mean by that? When we say be one gray in India, it should be one gray everywhere around the world for the same quantity of radiation. This is like any other measurement. For example, you have a weight of one kilogram. Whether you weigh it in India or weigh it in UK, it will be one kilogram. So you have certain quantity of radiation that you measured and you call it one gray. The same quantity of radiation that if it is measured in UK, US, Canada, Australia, everywhere, it, they have to call it one gray. So there has to be an international standard. The primary standard laboratory and the BIPM and the IAEA provide you this international standard. The International Atomic Energy Agency, in collaboration with the World Health Organization, the WHO, have established a network. This network is to facilitate uniformity of radiation dosimetry measurements around the world. They bring in all the primary standard, uh, secondary standard laboratories and several of the user clinic into the network. Maintain the consistency and accuracy of therapeutic doses by exercising a national and international intercomparison program. They have a national and international intercomparison program. Earlier they were using TLD for this. They call it TLD audit. Now they use glass dosimeter. They call it RPLD audit. And they provide a way of verifying and bringing a national sta international standard on dose measurement. And they also provide calibration services to end users. For example, if you want to have your ion chamber calibrated, it should be possible to get it calibrated at IAEA, provided your country is not having a second standard laboratory facility. So if your country is not able to do calibration, you don't have a second standard dosimetry laboratory, then you can approach IAEA for calibration of your dosimeter. When you measure output in a linear accelerator with your ion chamber, we say the ion chamber calibration should be traceable. We use this terminology traceability or your measurement should be traceable. I said the measurement, you, if you measure one gray for a certain amount of radiation, the same amount of radiation should produce one gray measurement everywhere in the world or anywhere in the world. So there has to be a traceability. When you say, your measurement is traceable. What do you mean by that? That means the chamber that you use is calibrated either in a primary standard laboratory directly for absorbed dose or at an accredited dosimetry laboratory or a secondary standard dosimetry laboratory which has a calibration with the primary standard dosimetry laboratory which means yours is now traceable to secondary standard which is traceable to the primary standard. So your measurement can be traced to the primary standard dosimetry. Sometimes you may use a dosimeter in your clinic, 
which is not calibrated in a secondary standard or a primary standard, but rather it was calib cross calibrated in your clinic with another ion chamber, which is calibrated to a primary or a secondary standard laboratory. So in that case, your traceability is from your chamber to your calibrated chamber, then to PSDL and or SSDL and PSDL. So this is what we mean by traceability. If you measure with an ion chamber, there with a calibration factor, that should be traceable to a primary standard. This flow chart actually explains you the traceability of the to the primary standard at the international level, the traceability of your dosimetry. For example, you are the user, you would have calibrated either in an SSDL or at IAEA. This SSDL would have calibrated with a PSDL or the BIPM or another some other primary standard. Now you could also, if your country has a primary standard laboratory, you could also directly have it in a primary standard. And these people, the IAEA, primary standard, secondary standard, they all have a network and they verify the dosimetry with each other. So you have a traceability now. So this flowchart actually explains you how the traceability works. Why absorb dose to water calibration? The question may be quite funny for the youngsters because they always measure absorbed dose to water. But if you think of the period before year 2000, IEA had a code of practice called a TRS-277. That was mainly providing absorbed dose to water from air kerma or N gas. In the year 2000, IEA came up with TRS-398 which recommended direct measurement of dose in water. So the purpose of doing this is, when you do absorb dose measurement in air and then do convert it to water, many factors are involved in the dosimetric chain. Starts with calibration factor in terms of air karma NK measured in air using cobalt 60 and ends with absorbed dose to water DW measured in water in a clinical B. Between this and the measurement in the clinical beam, uncertainties in chain arise mainly from conversion performed by the user at the hospital. So that was bringing in quite a uncertainties. To avoid that, in year 2000, IEA came up with TRS-398, which recommended absorbed dose calibration in water and absorbed dose measurement in water directly. So the TRS-277 became TRS-399. Subsequently, TG, uh, at the same time, TG-21 of AAPM, they converted that to TG-51. In si very similar to what IAA had done, they also did by moving from TG-21 to TG-51. Who should be using TRS-399? So this question was very relevant in the year 2000 to early 2000, because most of the calibration laboratories, SSDLs, were providing NK or N gas. Therefore, one had to use 277. In the year 2000, when TRS-398 came, not every laboratory was providing NDW, that is, dose to water calibration factor. You can use TRS-399 only if you have NDW, that is dose to water calibration factor. If you have NK or NX or NGAS, then you should use the older code of practice. So therefore, if you have NDW, you are permitted to use TRS-398. When is the right time for calibration? or absorb dose measurement and a reference condition in your LINAC or in a cobalt. Before the first medical use of the unit, you got a new LINAC or a new cobalt unit. Before you go clinical on it, you have to do absorb dose measurement and a reference condition. Secondly, following replacement of the source, particularly in the case of cobalt, where you change the source after every five to seven years. 
when you change the source, you have to do absorb dose measurement as per the code of practice. Following a reinstallation of the teletherapy unit in a new location, sometimes you decide to move, move your cobalt unit or a linear accelerator from one bunker to another bunker, which means it's a reinstallation. You need to do absorb dose measurement as per TRS-398 code of practice. Is that all? No. You most importantly, routinely as per the institutional practice, that is annual calibration. Some institution like the one I work, we used to do every six months. And we also do very routinely, weekly, monthly and all, but there we use a ion chamber that was cross calibrated against the one we calibrated in a second standard dosimetry laboratory. We don't use the one that we calibrated in a second standard dosimetry laboratory for our regular dose measurement because that is something precious. We keep it and we use another dosimeter which is cross calibrated with that for our regular dosimetry verification. This slide actually repeats what I said earlier that if you're using TRS-398, it assumes that you have a calibration factor NDW for your ion chamber and electrometer combination to determine absorbed dose to water. NDW is the dose to water calibration factor. What are the advantages of using TRS-398 for absorbed dose calibration? Number one, it's very general can be used for kilo voltage, medium KV, low KV, mega voltage, high energy photon and electron beams, protons and heavy ions. It's a straightforward process, very easy to use, less factors are required and you can directly use NDW. Only conversion required is for the beam quality of this NDW, which I will discuss in the next slide. The NDW based formalism is that you get dose to water for the user quality. Q here means your energy, user quality. Dose to water in user quality is equal to meter reading for that particular user quality multiplied by NDW Q0 where Q0 is the reference quality for obtaining the calibration factor NDW. KQQ0, where KQQ0 is the conversion factor for converting the calibration factor from the reference quality Q0 to the user quality Q. MQ, as I said, is the reading of the dosimeter, but it has all the corrections incorporated for the influence quantities. KQQ0, as I just explained, is the correction factor which corrects the NDWQ0 that is done for cobalt 60, that is the reference beam quality Q0 to the actual beam quality, the user beam quality Q. So the only correction factor here is the KQQ0. The next thing one has to do is to determine the correction factors for influence quantities. So what are the number one pressure, temperature and humidity correction factor called the KTP. Number two electrometer calibration factor which is K electrometer. This is required only if your electrometer is calibrated separately from your ion chamber. Most often the electrometer and the ion chambers are calibrated together. In that case, this factor will be one. The third one is the polarity correction factor. The polarity of a correction factor KPOL will have to be determined for your ion chamber. Similarly, the fourth one is that ion recombination correction factor KS, which will also have to be determined for your ion chamber. Let us see First, why to apply pressure and temperature correction factor? The mass of air contained in the sensitive volume of the chamber is equal to density into volume. That is density of air into volume of the chamber. Where rho air is the density, air density, B effective is the effective sensitive volume of the chamber. So the mass of air is given by density into volume. 
most of the ion chambers that we use are open to ambient atmosphere. The air density is a function of atmospheric pressure, temperature and humidity. Therefore, the charge collected by the chamber is also a function of atmospheric pressure, temperature and humidity. I will tell you a little more on this in the next slide. As I said, most chambers used for absorbed dose measurement are open to ambient temperature and pressure. So the mass of air in the cavity volume will be subjected to this atmospheric variation. Because the mass of air is density into volume, the density is subjected to this, so the mass will change. Therefore, correction should be applied to convert cavity air mass to the reference condition. The, what is the reference condition? Condition at which the chamber was calibrated in your SSDR. So you have to convert to that pressure and temperature. How do we do that? We will see in the next slide. If the temperature is higher, there will be less molecules in the chamber. If the pressure is higher, there will be more molecules in the chamber. So we have to apply the temperature and pressure correction. One interesting thing is, if you look at your calibration certificate, they provide you at what reference temperature and pressure the chamber was calibrated. For example, in this case, at 20 degrees centigrade and 1013.2 millibar pressure. By chance, if your clinic where you do this measurement and the phantom temperature is 20 degrees centigrade and the pressure in the room is 1013.2 millibar, then you don't need to apply pressure temperature correction factor. But I tell you, it will never be the case. There will be variation. So you have to calculate the pressure temperature correction factor using this formula where P0 is the reference pressure under which the dosimeter was calibrated in the SSDL or PSDL. In this case is 113.2 millibar and T0 is the reference temperature under which the SSDL calibrated your ion chamber. P and T are the pressure in your room and T is the temperature of the phantom. Please make sure that you use the same unit for the pressure as per your measurement. I had to convert here to kilopascals because the barometer I have measures in kilopascal. So I converted the reference pressure to kilopascals. Please also note, it is not always 20 degrees centigrade at which the SSDL provides you the calibration. Some of the SSDLs have the habit of calibrating the ion chamber at 22 degrees centigrade. So then in that case, the T0 will become 22. So one has to be very careful about these values without looking into your calibration certificate. Do not start your absorbed dose measurement. Please note pressure should be measured in the clinic and obtaining pressure value from a meteorological department could lead to error. See, this is an interesting story about it. There is an interesting story about it. And one of the clinics, which was in a very high hill station, he didn't have a barometer, so he decided to call the airport to find the temperature and pressure. The airport provided him, provided him with a sea level pressure. But he was, a, he was at a very high altitude because he was in a hill station and the pressure was low. So in effect, his output measurement was wrong by about 15%. This resulted in wrong dose delivery to the patients. So please note, you have to have your barometer and you need to measure in your clinic. Don't borrow the pressure value or temperature value from somewhere else. Points to remember. Temperature should be measured in water phantom. Room temperature should not be used. Please be careful. No correction for humidity is needed if relative humidity of calibration was at 50 and your room is between 20 and 80%. The temperature pressure calibration could be as high as 15% for altitudes, high altitudes and hill stations. The second factor, as I said, is the electrometer calibration factor. And as I explained earlier, 
This is needed only if the electrometer is calibrated separately. Otherwise, the electrometer calibration factor will be one because most often we do the electrometer calibration along with the ion chamber. The next one is the polarity effect correction factor. If a chamber exhibits measurable polarity effect, the true reading is taken as the mean of the absolute values of readings taken at two polarities, that is negative and positive polarities. So what you have to do is, you put it at the positive polarity, which is normally the polarity and voltage at which it was calibrated, measure the value which will be M plus and then go to negative polarity and then measure the value M minus and take the mean which will be the K pole that is the polarity effect correction factor. If the polarity effect for a particular chamber is larger than 3% please don't use it you get it corrected right so polarity effect cannot be too high Please remember that. The next one we have to do is the ion recombination correction. This graph I like, I thought I will keep it. The incomplete collection of charge in an ionization chamber cavity owing to the recombination of ion requires the use of a correction factor. This is because you have not collected all the ions. So you have to verify whether all the ions have been collected. Right. So what is this about? This graph explains you what is this recombination. See, in your ion chamber, if you increase the voltage between the electrodes, the charge collected will increase. And it at one point, it becomes almost like saturation value and then it saturates. So the region before the saturation value is called recombination region. That is, the ions, all the ions are not collected. Some of the ions are left over and they recombine. This is called a recombination, right? And we normally operate our ion chamber one third, somewhere around this area, which is the saturation region, right? So we use the voltage somewhere between 300 to 400 here where it is saturated, but still it is necessary to look at whether any ions have not been collected and left, right? So to address this question, we have the ion recombination correction. To give you more information about this ion recombination correction, there are two separate effects take place. The recombination of ions formed by separate ionizing particle tracks termed general recombination, which is dependent on the density of ionizing particles and therefore on the dose rate. So this recombination depends on the dose rate. The recombination of ions formed by a single ionizing particle track referred to as the initial recombination, which is independent of the dose rate. So there are two different types of recombination that occur. So we have to take into account these ones. Therefore, we have a correction for recomb ion recombination. Here there is an interesting thing you have to remember. For pulsed beams, the recombination correction factor Ks at the nominal operating voltage V1 is obtained by two voltage method. V1 is the voltage at which your chamber was originally calibrated, let me say plus 300. Then you obtain your meter reading, which is M1, then reduce the voltage, maybe to 100, that is V2, and get your meter reading M2. And then use this equation to get the recombination correction factor. This equation is useful or true for pulsed beams. Please remember this. Number two, these constants A1, A2, A0 are provided. These are quadratic fit coefficients which are provided in TRS-398 for various V1 by V2. But in case, if your beam is a continuous beam like cobalt 60, you still use two voltage method, but the equation is different you cannot use the same equation. So Ks is equal to V1 by V2 whole square minus one divided by V1 by V2 whole square minus M1 by M2. 
So V1 again is the normal voltage, which was plus 300 in our case. And V2 is the reduced voltage, which was the plus 100 in our case. M1 and M2 are the readings for the V1 and V2. So you will be able to get the KS from this equation. Some of the points to remember for ion recombination correction. KS is determined differently for pulsed and continuous radiation. Please remember that. Two voltage method may not be suitable for some parallel plate chambers. One important thing you got to remember is the V1 by V2 should ideally be equal to or larger than three, right? So please make sure you use 300 and 100 or 400 and 100, right? It has to be equal to or larger than three. The last point is about the pulsed beam and this is not very important for it, but since we have it, I'll tell you. For the purpose of making recombination correction, proton synchrotron beams of long pulse duration and low pulse repetition frequency may be considered as continuous beam. We are not going to discuss proton or uh, heavy ions in this course, so you don't need to worry about it now, but you need to know this. So the correction for electrometer reading MQ, the corrected electrometer reading for user beam quality Q will be meter reading, that is the raw meter reading in nanocoulomb, corrected for temperature pressure, polarity correction, recombination correction, and if there is an electrometer calibration factor and for electrometer calibration. Thank you very much for your patient listening. And I hope this lecture was very useful. And as you always, we have some MCQs with this. Please do these MCQs before we move on to the next lecture. Thank you very much.